Um, okay, this is Diagnose Your Chess. This is a weekly show that I do uh, for uh, CoChess, CoChess.com, uh, as well as Chess24. Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, and on this show, we basically we work with a new player every week and we get into their chess. We try to talk a little bit about their chess training, what they're doing, what their goals are. Uh, and then we go in and we look at some games and, and see if we can give them, yeah, a real like a diagnosis of, of their chess, their strengths, their weaknesses, and, and what to work on uh, to improve for the future. Um, so uh, for today's show, I have with me Joel from uh, Canada. Uh, Joel, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Um, actually, what part of Canada are you from? I, Hi, thanks for doing it. I didn't uh, ask you. Uh, I'm from Toronto. Oh, Toronto. Cool, cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so we usually start off with just uh, some questions. We were already talking uh, before the stream, but I want to kind of catch everyone um, up to date. Um, so tell us about your your chess, Joel. You know, what does a typical week or month of chess look like for you? Um, what kind of games are you playing? And um, yeah, what uh, what does your chess look like? Yeah, so I've been playing chess for a long while. I've been playing since I was a kid, uh, since I was uh, quite young. I've played over the board in a tournament. I've played one tournament in my life. It, it's the, uh, it was the Canadian Open 2006, Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, I actually played Botez in that tournament. Um, if I would have beaten her, I would have been able to say I beat Botez in that tournament. So obviously I didn't beat her. Um, <laughs> but that was my only over the board <laughs> tournament. Um, but now I'm exclusively playing 10-minute games on chess.com. Uh, I used to play on ICC, um, and my rating has been sort of at in the 1600s, 1700s, or 1800s the entire time. Mm -hmm. um, for I've been playing like for the last, I guess ICC I was playing probably in the late, probably not the late 90s, maybe around around the turn of the century, I guess, 2000 mm -hmm. or so. So I've been playing for for online for about 20 years. Um, so I've played, like on ICC, I used to play 20-minute games and 40-minute games, um, but now on uh, chess.com, it's the 10-minute game. I just, um, you know, new game, new game, new game. And then after the game, I'll look it over with the um, report, mm -hmm. um, uh, which isn't the best, really. I should probably be delving a little bit more into my games. Um, and my, my rating's just been around 1750 for the last few years. Cool, and um, I, I know you've been really active in the uh, the dojo uh, Discord. Or do you basically play like every day or almost every day? Yeah, yeah. Whenever I have a few free minutes, like I'm bored on my phone, um, so instead of you know sitting and watching YouTube videos, uh, which I do as well, but mm -hmm. I'll I'll play a ten minute game, or which is ten minute for either side. So I've got free twenty minutes. I probably play good. I don't know. Um, 10 games a day or something like that, let's say. Gotcha. And did you mention you, do you play on your phone frequently? Yes. Okay. Uh, that's yeah. interesting. It, that's a new thing. That's a new phenomenon, like playing on your phone that, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think jury's still out on it because it, it's, it's different. Yeah, well, I, I play online, I play on the browser as well, but I don't see like a performance degradation or maybe there is a performance degradation. I can probably do an analysis on this at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I find that like the opponents I'm being matched with, like my, my rating will fluctuate between, I guess the low 1700s and the high 1700s. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going back and forth between the phone and the browser. So I don't, I don't know if that really makes much of a difference. Yeah, I'm, I have no idea. I, I definitely think there's a strong difference between playing like over the board and playing on a screen, like playing online. And um, if you if you only do one, then you, you'll be much more comfortable with that. So people who play online a lot are going to feel more comfortable online. People who play over the board are going to feel more comfortable over the board. But when it comes from like, yeah, going from the computer to the phone, I'm not sure that it might be the same. To me, it feels um, like whenever I play on, on the phone, I always feel like I'm even less focused than when I play um, on the uh, computer, but I mean that's just that's just me. So I, I'm not really sure. Just something to to yeah, consider. Yeah, I've done my fair share of over the board playing. Like when I used to do over the board when I was much younger. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a while since I played a real over the board game. Um, 
Yeah, so. you mentioned that you um you just played one uh like classical tournament, like in person tournament. Um, is is the goal to ever uh, play more of these events, or are you just trying to work on like your online game? Yeah, I know if an event comes up, uh, like that event came out was the Canadian Open. I saw like, I don't know where I saw it advertised or where I was tuned in that it was happening. And I saw Kitchener, Ontario. So I jumped on the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone into club a couple of times, like here in Toronto, we have a couple of them um, that, that I used to go to. Um, like there's a community center, but that was when I was a kid. Like this is, I'm going back 20 years now. Right. Um, you know, um, I've, I've like, when I was in New York, I checked out Bryant Park or Washington Square Park and played a few, a few of the hustlers there. So I enjoy, I enjoy the over the board experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I know I don't get an opportunity to do it, but I, I, I feel comfortable with that. Like I would do it if I'd have the opportunity. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, let's get a sense of kind of like how you work on your chest. Cause I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure you you're pretty well read, right? Like you, you, you mentioned um, some books before, and well, let's get a sense of how are you working on your chess nowadays? Is there anything you're doing, like solving puzzles or, or doing any books or lessons or anything like that? Yeah, so I like to do puzzles. Um, I've always been like that's always been my primary way of, of training. Mm -hmm. um, like I had uh, Fred Reinfeld's uh, Thousand One. Um, winning chess combinations and strat and, and uh, sacrifices and, co and combinations, um, as well as like there's a bunch of other puzzle books. And now with chess.com, like I do puzzles every day. I got like the gold, the gold or the premium membership at one point. I was doing like I think it maxed out at the lowest membership level. It was I think 25 a day. So I was maxing those out. But then I stopped paying for that membership. So they only give me about five a day. So I went over to Lee Chess. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm doing like a bunch on Lee Chess. And I tend to do pretty well on them. Like I can, you know, there's always ones that are tricky and say, oh, I didn't see that. Um, you know, I didn't get that idea. Right. Um, there's, we, we discussed it in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the discord. Um, you know, so I, I, I like to do those tactics puzzles. Uh, but when it comes to strategy and positional play, like I've, I've read, you know, my fair share of books, like, um, you know, Selman's, um, Selman's, um, how to reassess your chest, but that was a while ago. I've read some of the end game stuff. I've read Tarash's book. Uh, I like um, Irver's stuff, um, Max Irver, and uh, the um, his two part middle game series. Mm -hmm. um, I've read uh, what else? Um, Soltis's books. Um, again, I've never read. It. I, I don't. Re I don't typically read these books very thoroughly. Um, that's because I'm lazy to set, set up a board. So I'll go through it. Um, and look at the examples and play out as many moves like in my head from the diagrams as I can. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't actually set them up and play them out on the board. But I watch enough um, like YouTube videos like Agad Mador and um, some of the other channels that like go through classical games right. um, or tournament games. Like I was watching the Tata um, Steel. Um, and when I see the ideas, like I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Oh yeah, and on the dojo on the dojo channel, the Discord, mm -hmm. uh, they're starting to do Yusupov, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go along with that. I did the first chapter, but again, I did it without setting up the board. I cheated. <laughs> I see. Um, well, if if you're able to visualize the board from the diagram, because it sounds like your tactics are pretty good. Uh, I know your like your puzzle rating is like twenty four fifty, which um, I mean puzzle ratings are usually higher than like normal ratings, but I would say. I don't know, on average, maybe like plus 500, plus 400, and you're you're a little bit above that. So it, it seems like your puzzles are, are definitely quite good. And so that that might suggest your visualization is all right as well. Yeah, well, here's the problem, though. It's like it's all about the psychology. So when I'm doing a puzzle, I'm looking for ideas, and I know that there's an idea in that position. But when I play, my, my mind tends to want, like, I have a trouble in a position saying, okay, here's the point. I'm looking for an idea. And you can see from my time control, sometimes I spend two or three minutes at a position, say, I know there's something there, and I won't find it, and I'll just end up playing a safe move. Mm -hmm. The other thing that happens is sometimes I'll just um, hang a piece, or I, I'll, I won't realize that my opponent has something there where he can win a pawn. So usually it's actually not, it, the problem is not so much that I can't find my own ideas. Um, you might see in some of my games, like I've got some pretty original ideas, like when I'm behind about how I, you know, swindle the other player, but mm -hmm. I get, I, I, I'll just drop pieces here and there just cause I'm not looking, I'm not on, I'm not alert. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really, um, 
a big uh, uh, point of chess is is that like right it's not just as simple you, you know you have a clear solution and then you find it and then you're done uh, in a real game you never know when there's a tactic you never know what the opponent is planning if they have tactics and yeah there's all these like little micro skills that have to get built up along the way of not just seeing uh, your own ideas but also um, anticipating your opponent's moves seeing the threat um, and then seeing you know how to avoid the threat in the most um, let's say uh, accurate uh, way um, so that's definitely something we'll get into as we uh, take a look at, at some of your games because the practical side of things is is really is really really uh, tricky um, it yeah it sounds like you're reasonably well read like uh, you mentioned Silman and uh, the middle game books uh, so I assume you're familiar with with stuff like uh, typical imbalances and um, uh, things of that nature um, so yeah I feel like we should uh, I think we should just get into it I haven't seen any of your games yet um, so this will just be my first time and um, I definitely want to start with a game that you remember so I just chose this one at random but do you remember playing this one these are my most recent games so I, I picked off from chess.com I took out some that were just um, really silly um, so I, I sort of filtered it a bit uh, these aren't the greatest games um, but I think what they will demonstrate was what I was talking about. Like I know all the, the imbalances, the Silman's imbalances, or uh, or the positional concepts. But then you'll watch my games and you'll be like, the way I'm, it, it doesn't match my knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, I play like a I play like a, a beginner, like a twelve hundred. So somebody's gonna look and it's like, why did he just hang his piece? Like what was he thinking? I wasn't thinking. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. No. I mean, well, uh, ten minute chess is is pretty fast still, so it's um, really difficult to uh, to play an accurate game from start to finish um, for for all players. It's just not a lot of time. Um, the other thing I should note is that um, just totally lost my <laughs> my train of thought. Um, oh, right. Well, I'll add to it. Yeah. yeah so yeah, like the. I've used these tools like Aim Chess, or I think Lee Chess is even has it, where it diagnoses mm -hmm. like your styles. And my accuracy actually isn't that bad. Like it tells me that I'm actually not blundering more often, or my accuracy isn't below average than what it should be for my rating. Um, but I think it's just that like critical moments, or it's just maybe in critical games. I don't know what it is. But maybe I'm being too hard on myself. You know? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I guess what I, what I wanted to say is that like. Um... Blitz and Rapid are really good for kind of showing you your strengths and your weaknesses because since you don't have a lot of time, you have to rely on your instincts. And if you understand a position, then you'll kind of know what to do, like what a good plan is. You can kind of follow that. Um, and if you don't understand a position, if you're not sure what to do, then it's really easy to misplay it or to hang something because you're not kind of familiar with the ideas there. But then when it comes to improvement, a lot of that I think happens well, off the board, like kind of learning new ideas or practicing your calculation kind of in, in a new way, or let's say trying to go deeper, um, as well as let's say playing longer time control games where you kind of have more time to, let's say, think about the position and, and try to incorporate what you've been uh, working on before. Whereas even if you're studying a lot, if you then go and play like Blitz and Rapid, it's really hard to kind of use the new knowledge because you, you don't really have a lot of time. It's a very conscious process. So you need to kind of like, you're, you're going to end up relying on your instincts again. Um, actually, the question in the chat here, any tips for players who are stuck that aren't really stuck and <laughs> just afraid to play games and it might affect the peak rating? Yeah, actually, I mean, for me, like uh, the way I see it is, you know, your, your goal should be kind of, you know, you have your immediate goal. Let's say you're trying to get to that next level, but you should also have like a long term goal and on the way to that long-term goal you're going to have many peak ratings so if you go up and down a little bit like your current rating is not really important right you're you're working towards your future rating right you're trying to get better so your current rating is whatever it goes up it goes down one or one or two games isn't going to matter it's all about like working on your chess consistently for extended periods of time not one or two days but you know three to four to five months right at a time and then at the end of that, then you come out a better player, and then your rating will go up, and you can you can enjoy that. But from game to game, it's gonna go up and down all the time. So definitely not something worth worth worrying about. 
Uh, and I should say, for almost every player I've seen, as soon as they hit like 2200, they almost immediately crash right back down to like 2170. Just like I remember when I hit 2200 USCF or whatever it was, like immediately went back down probably 20, 30 points. And it often happens with plateaus or with peaks. So yeah, you learn to just kind of always be thinking about the, the next goal. Um, okay, let's keep going through the game here. So E5, I like that. That's a good move. Okay, so you played h5 here, so this is uh, this is a really aggressive idea. Is this something you, you find yourself doing frequently, like against the Fianchetta, or maybe just for the... Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't thinking that it was because it was against the Fianchetta, or maybe it was. This is what I was thinking here. Um, I guess I was just reading Chernev's book, um, Logical Chess, and he doesn't explicitly explain about color weaknesses, but the entire first section, Kingside Attack, um, if you're is all about color weaknesses right so i was really conscious of that um when i was playing this game and i said okay you know there's that there's that light squared bishop if i can somehow get rid of that bishop i could um exploit the light square weaknesses with my light squared um bishop um but then i said okay well, how can i attack that bishop like there's no way to get at it right mm -hmm. trying to get at it with a from like f4 or h4 is a possibility but my knight has sort of a hard time getting there especially since those squares are nicely protected by pawns so i figure okay the only way i can get it is maybe sort of advance my pawn up and try to squeeze that pawn into h3 or maybe make an exchange on the h file and then use my rook so i needed an attack somehow that's the only way i saw an attack happening no, i could have castled first but yeah. i didn't want to Right. No, I, I like the move a lot. I, I think it, it's fully justified because you have kind of like more space in the center. And um, yeah, once you play h4 here, you can decide whether you want to take and open the h file or push h3 and, and kind of squeeze that pawn in there, which is very annoying to deal with. Um, okay, so white plays f3, e4, go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we can see the, or I guess people can't see the engine uh, bar, but it's like yeah, huge swings. Um, this is where drunken, yeah, this is where the drunken sailor syndrome kicks in. If you go back a few moves, I think it was that F6 move mm -hmm. where I was like, I think if you, I, oh, you can't see the time controls on this, but you can see I was thinking for like uh, two minutes there or something like that. I'm like. Okay, uh, go, yeah, go even back another one, right? Uh, oh, I see. No, go back another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, I brought the queen in there. I'm like, okay, great, but, like, what do I do now? Uh, and I was just thinking, thinking, no ideas came up. So I said, I have to protect. I think I was worried about that rook on the F file. I think that's why I did that. I said, okay, you know what? I want to be able to use that bishop somehow, and I don't want it to be tied down to the F7 pawn. So I'm like, okay, let's close up that file. And and then and then continue the game in the center yeah th this is actually quite a sound move strategically because you're also um supporting the e5 square which is like your blockading square and yeah even if you're if you don't get anything with the knight on g4 you end up having to move it back to e5 it, it's kind of nicely supported there so um strategically i think you're you're doing quite uh, quite well here playing against white's kind of isolated um pawn so e5 really sharp move um okay we play g5 bishop c1 take take here three take the rook c7 i think i just ran out of tactical ideas so that was the problem when you said that other move was a sharp idea it comes to positions like that where where that should be the time i have like before I made that that G pawn push, mm -hmm. I probably thinking for like I was, then I started looking for tactical ideas, and when nothing occurred to me, mm -hmm. I just made like a silly move or something like that. Like I didn't even know if that was the best move. No, no, it definitely wasn't. Right? It was totally winning. Yeah. For white. I mean, I mean, I don't. I'm honestly not really paying attention to the uh, computer so much here because like in sharp positions, you're often going to make moves that might give your opponent some kind of chance like here maybe it's e takes f6 maybe that was the problem like bishop is hanging um on e6 
Uh, so, yeah, but the thing is, it's like, the engine always finds stuff, but but you're not playing against the engine, you know, you're playing against humans who aren't going to see everything, and they're especially not going to see the really, like, tricky tactics that the engine sometimes uh, comes up with. So, for the purposes of this, like, I'm just trying to get, you know, a sense of um, your games. If, if we discover that, like, oh, you're blundering tactics, like, every game, then that might be an issue to think about, but... Um, I mean, so far, I feel like you played very reasonably in this game. Like, your moves are logical, and it's like a 10-minute game, right? So I'm not expecting you to play uh, with, with computer accuracy here. Uh, more, I'm just kind of looking for, like, things that you're kind of naturally doing well, and maybe things that aren't, um, aren't like, so obvious for you. Um, but let's take this one. Okay. Up in, and... Nice. Ended up mating. Yep. I remember. It was a blunder on his part, but I, I exploited it. Yeah, he blundered, but you know, it's like, White was under pressure the whole game, basically, and usually people blunder when, <laughs> when that's the case. So, it's not not too surprising. <laughs> um, okay, let's jump to another game. All right, this is against uh, another player. Someone rating. Oh, this was really fast. Or maybe I think I, I I think I brought this I put this game in just to show a blunder I made and then we'll diagnose like why did I make that blunder? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember which what games which. We'll go through it. We'll see. Mm -hmm. D five. I'm playing what black? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, that was the blunder. There you go. Oh <laughs> it's wow. The opening. Oh. I didn't. I hung up. Bummer. Um, I'm yeah. thinking about strategic ideas. Right? Mm -hmm. What um? That's the only reason. I gave it this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it is an interesting blunder, though. I mean, do do you kind of remember what happened? Like you just were kind of zoned out. No, I think I was actually thinking. I was like, okay, what development move should I make now? So uh, let's see. I want to castle. I want to protect the e pawn. I don't want to take the 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 light squared bishop out just yet. Um, okay, so what's my most logical development move for that bishop? Uh, so I said, obviously, well, it's not a3, it's not b4, it's not going to be c5 either. I want to be aggressive. Okay, d6 looks like, okay, great, it's protecting the pawn. And I'm not checking for, like, am I hanging any pieces because it's move 6, right? So mm -hmm. you don't look for that move 6. I see. Yeah, you, you certainly wouldn't be, like, necessarily, let's say, like, looking for tactics, although... To me, this one feels like a case of, um, like, this d6 is kind of like a mind square. Like, if you put something on the d-file, because you're, like, you know, blocking your queen, it's, um, uh, tactically should kind of, like, it normally is a red flag. Although, you know, obviously people will miss stuff all the time. There are certain, there are, like, different types of blunders. Like, I think most typical is simply when you, like, you put a piece on a square, you just didn't see that it was, um, attacked. But... Uh, I would never expect someone to blunder, like, for example, playing, um, need an arrow here, like, queen to g3, and then they didn't see that, like, the pawn could take. It's like, okay, you know this square, like, no one ever blunders like that. It's always, like, more of, like, a long-range thing, but, I don't know, just, uh... Yeah, well, this one I'm blocking protection. I, I say, oh, that knight's safe, that knight's good in the center, so I take my attention off the knight, and now I'm looking at the, now I'm looking at the bishop, and I don't realize I'm blocking that. I'm blocking that defensively. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I'll make blunders like this. I'll throw away, you know, probably, uh, I don't know, 20% of my games just because of blunders like this. Oh, I see. Oh, so it'll, probably, it'll, happen, it'll happen frequently. Too, fre too frequently. Yeah, more frequently than I'd like. It, than I'd like. Yeah, for sure. Because, I mean, you're, like, you're, again, your tactics rating is quite strong. So this is something that should kind of, yeah, be reduced the, the higher you get. Um so I don't know. I mean, it, it might be something with like the uh, the focus. Yeah, if you're overthinking things, then yeah, you kind of forget to think um, tactically. Uh, yeah, and overthinking. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, especially when I'm struggling to find a strategic idea in a position, I'll take my mind off the off the uh, looking for threats. I see. I see. Yeah. So that's maybe something. Yeah, we'll talk about more. But it's always very important to just stay like tactically alert. Especially for a rapid game, yeah, you have limited time, and so you only have so much time to calculate. It's like every second is valuable um, analysis <laughs> energy. 
Yeah, when I watch guys like okay, I'm not even gonna say Nakamura because he's just a he's just a god. But right. when I watch like even just strong players playing these speed games and they bring their queen like over a square to protect like their pawn, like oh, I didn't even see that 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 pawn was 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 being threatened. Like over protection, those concepts are are things that are quite lost on me. Mm. You know, um. I, I've read a lot of I don't know I'm, you're familiar with Dan Heisman, but he, this is something he talks about a lot, right? Like looking for trouble. Right? Mm -hmm. And also like hope chess of just looking at what I can do and not looking at what my opponent can do. Mm -hmm. So I suffer from that. I see. Okay. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, it, it's it's not the worst position to be in. I mean, in general, like it's good to play active chess and playing uh, in an aggressive style where you're posing problems and tactics for the opponent, because um, this is what's going to create winning chances. So I would much rather have you be someone who's like very aggressive and then, okay, we just have to maybe rein you in a bit or learn how to play more like prophylactically versus the other way around. It's very tough to develop that um, aggressive sense. Um, yeah. So G6. There you go. I got the seventh rank. Game over. Yeah, yeah. I feel like this game you played really, really well. I mean, it, it's kind of like a simple position, but um, there's still so many ways for both sides to go wrong here. But I, I feel like you handled it really nicely. Um, so I'm wondering if if it's just the blunders that might be like <laughs> it might be the thing holding you back. You know, holding me back. Yeah, and, and that's the thing for somebody who's been playing for over 20 years. Like it's something that I should develop an intuition for seeing that pieces are hanging. But it's just something that maybe I just play so aggressively and I'm always looking for threats and, and, and attacking ideas um, that I just have like some mental block there. I don't know. It's possible. Um, I want to see a few more blunders before I I make too many judgments. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You make the diagnosis. <laughs> right, because it's... Um... Well, okay, it's, it's so easy to make draw conclusions from like one or two games, but that, yeah, uh, often means very little. Uh, you know, you could... Yeah, two games at random, you know, could mean anything. Um, let's keep going. Let's keep going. But that was that was a very like quality game. I feel like that was really clean. Okay. Um, all right. This game we're playing white. Uh, is it the, yeah? Was it Tay Joel? If it's Tay, it's uh, I'm playing black here. I think. Oh, I'm on the game against um, Ashat, Ashat Hay. Oh, so maybe Ditch didn't refresh for yeah. me yet. Ditch yeah, good thing cool. we checked. <laughs> so looks like a Sicilian, where Black took on d4 twice. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I get that. I have players do that against me. I love playing against a Sicilian as white, and that's the attacking. I love attacking on the king side when I'm being attacked on the queen side. I'm just like, I'm not looking at that. <laughs> and I'm only attacking, and I and I win half of them, and I lose half of them. But that's mm. the type of chess I like. Yeah, it's it's fun for sure. Um, okay, question in the chat: Do you find it easier to fix mistakes or teach the attacking concepts in general? I'm not sure. It it it's hard to um, it's hard to teach, let's say, new ideas to students who like are kind of set in their habits, like they have their positions and their structures that they like. Um, so it's can be hard to uh, grow when someone is really like doing the same thing. So in general, I like kind of introducing new ideas and I, I feel like it's, um, yeah, it's easier to start from scratch uh, in some cases. Um, okay, bishop e5, a little a little odd just because it feels like it gives black um, some time as well. But, um, okay, here. One. Three. And here I castled on the. This is not the typical type of uh, Sicilian that I play. I'm usually castled. I, I play the Sicilian where I, I usually I usually play bishop to e3 and then mm -hmm. queen to d2, castle queen side, mm -hmm. um, and then push f3 and g4. Uh, and I use that against the dragon, I use that against the Nidorf. Basically, any Sicilian, I'll usually do that, that type of system, I guess you can call it. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think it's called the English. English attack, exactly. Although here, Black kind of 
did this weird thing where they trade on d4 and they bring your queen out really early. Um, yeah, so when that happens, I'm like, okay, I'm not playing that system anymore. Now I'm just playing it by, by um, on the whim. You know, I'm not, I'm not really anymore. Yeah, in it my can, comfort. It can be hard to write. Yeah, figure out like how to develop actually because it's not, it's not what we're used to. Uh, I don't know. Tobias knight c3 feels like the most natural start just because the knight is almost always going here. Um, and then, I guess like. You know, if knight f6, maybe bishop g5, like you played, and castle and queen side actually might be totally possible um, after after the bishop comes out. So maybe you could get something that kind of resembles like a, an English attack, with like f3. Um, c4 is also suggested. This is possible too, although mm, if, if you're not like super familiar with this kind of structure, like Marazzi bind, then it's not exactly the easiest thing. No. To handle right so i, would, I don't i don't, I don't I'm, I'm not a... mm -hmm. yeah. no sorry what were you saying i'm not i'm not and it's silly and i never play c4 in silly and my, my pawn always stays at c2 gotcha so yeah then knights because i'm using the cast on the side right it, right yeah um okay so here here So yeah, eventually black just kind of gets a comfortable Sicilian. Yeah, and that's that's because I like sort of ran out of attacking ideas. I'm like, okay, I'm developed here. I, I need to attack. I don't see any tactical ideas, so then I just waddle. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like once, um, once we play f3, actually, in this position, it's kind of over because um, it, it's like now black yeah, what is do I do now? basically totally fine. Yeah, exactly. And and it's actually white is in danger of being worse here because black's counterplay is only starting on the C file. And black is going to, like your opponent did, push A5 and yeah, very comfortable position here. Um, so I, I don't know. I think yeah. the engine and that's why I played like, A4. And you can see the same theme that I had in the other game, like when I pushed, pushed the H pawn, where, where I, when I finished developing all my pieces and I run out of tactical ideas, I'm like, okay, let's just pu push the wing, wing pawns now. Mm hmm. Well, right? I guess uh, no. That's I, why I do that. Right, right, right. No, I mean, it's very natural. Like it, we always want to kind of do something in in the position, um, and usually it is better to do something than to just kind of sit around and and wait. I think the the key idea was here maybe to to play this e5 move, um, like trading the dark squared bishops, and kind of clamping down on this d6 square. So the idea would be to potentially uh, play like your knight to e4. And then black has to either give up the bishop or allow the knight in. Um, I think this was maybe the way to go at at this yeah, point. Um, yeah. I don't think too much about square weaknesses. I should. Um, backward pawns. That's not something that, like, when I'm playing a game, is front and center. I'm looking for tactical ideas. Mm. But... Oh, okay. And when I look for tactical ideas, like in the other game where I talked about, I talked about the color square weaknesses around the Fianchetto's uh, bishop. So I do like, I do like base my ideas around sort of positional elements of the board, but I'm not looking for like um, positional like maneuvering. That's not like the type of chess I like to play. So I'm not usually looking for like, okay, where can I put pressure on like a weak square? I'm usually thinking about like, okay, where's my tactical ideas? Well, what are the position? What are the open files, for example, that I can attack along, or what are the you know, um, do I have a bishop pair? Do I have a good battery? Right. right? Those types of, of, of positional things I'm looking for just to give me attacking ideas. I see. Yeah. Um, so this is maybe something, right, we could, we could discuss because it sounds like you are focusing on targets, like tactical ideas, um, possible like forcing moves or sacrifices in the position that might work for you, which is very, very important. Um, and, and a lot of games will just be decided based on that alone. But it sounds like we need to incorporate a lot of, um, maybe like more of a positional evaluation as well, so that in positions where there are no immediate tactics, you still kind of know how to improve your position so that you're more likely to find yourself in, in a spot to, um, to execute some tactics later on. Um, so yeah, there is a, a sense of like, um, uh, you know, positional motives, let's put it that way, like forcing ideas that lead to positional advantages, taking control of squares or exchanging the right piece in the position to leave your opponent with like a bad, 
a bad setup after that. Um, so yeah, maybe something to to think about. In fact, I already have um, a book that I, I feel like would be uh, useful for you. It's this small book. Alfred? I have somewhere. No, um, it's called The Positional Chess Handbook uh, by Israel. Well, it's Gelfand, right? Gelfer. Um, Gelfer. Gelfer, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a different guy, yeah. <laughs> um, this is a really cool book because it has a lot of, um, it's also a book you can read right from the diagram, so I think you'll enjoy that. Um, but it, yeah, I've, I've looked at, I don't know that book, but I've seen that book before and it's, yeah, it's position after position after position. And it just tells you in each position, okay, what are the positional ideas in that, in that position? Yeah. And, and it basically just shows like a lot of, uh, motifs, um, like how to, yeah, take control over a key square, how to create some weaknesses in your opponent's position using a pawn break, how to, um, activate your pieces. It's definitely, there's like a ton of tactics in the book and combinations, but as you'll see, it all comes from the strategic side of chess, which is trying to make the most of, uh, use out of your pieces uh, at any given time. So it's, you know, whenever someone is sacrificing a pawn, it's almost always to open up lines, right, for the bishop, for the rook. So it has this kind of like strategic uh, basis. And that, and that book, I think, does a great job of kind of introducing, uh, well, basically the link between, between strategy and tactics, because these things are very much working together in, in games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think that would be useful because it shows yeah. a lot of these like cool ideas, um, like little advances and uh, 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 cute exchanges using tactics to like um, achieve a strategic goal. Uh, okay, question yeah. in the chat. I know that like yeah, Yuri, Yuri Aberbach. Oh. I kind of like Yuri Aberbach has a book about that as well, um, about like sort of link between tactics, and I think it's one of his middle game books. He has a bunch of them. Um, I've seen his end game book but that's pretty simple but he's got like a more advanced book which talks about the idea of the link between uh tactics and uh, strategy quite possible yeah it's definitely a like um let's say a core value of like the the soviet chess understanding yeah actually it's not as nasko Bravosky has one it's an old book uh, but his middle game book is about that too mm-hmm mm -hmm. oh and we take nice and what was your, um, do you remember, what was your evaluation of, of this endgame? Um, I think I, I think I thought I could make like a, I could get my king to the center a lot faster than he could. I didn't, I didn't think it, I, I didn't think I, I thought it would end up like this. Oh, I okay. I think I thought that I'd get the king to the center a lot faster. I thought that that would be a very weak bishop, a uh, weak pawn. Mm -hmm. Like if you go back several moves when I make that rook trade. Right. I said, oh, I can trade that rook, bring that pawn right out into the middle, and then I'm just chasing it down with my king, and I should win that one. And actually, I had that idea even two moves back from this. Yeah, here, when you when you took... Yeah, when... over there, exactly. I'm like, oh, you know what, let's, let's, yeah, let's isolate that pawn, and then make it a target. And then if I can't get that pawn, I can swing my, my king around to the A pawn, or I can make some type of break on the queen side. And if, while, while he's occupied on the queen side, I might be able to break on the king side, or I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it's the... probably the wrong no exchange was good um I, I think this is exactly the right because here you actually you give black a, a difficult choice um i think i don't know i i think i would have taken with the pawn here if i was black because these king and pawn end games you really don't know and you're absolutely right like only white um normally should be better here because black has this isolated pawn and your king kind of gets to the key key square uh d4 so whether you're winning or not, you're never going to know for sure in a game, but you can at least know that you're you're playing for the win and you're close. So from Black's point of view, the Rook end game is going to be offering more chances to hold on. Because in the Rook end game, okay, Black is worse, but not like, you know, in the King and Pawn end game, Black might just be losing on the spot. Um, so this was definitely a good and decision I, to go I for had this. Suspicion. I, knew, I knew he would take with the Rook. I don't know why. I guess when you're <laughs> playing like at the level it's sort of like yeah he's gonna take with a rook i just know what's gonna happen and i'm gonna go for it like i, I knew where this was going i need to make that move. no it, it does happen yeah players are actually very um yeah very willing to go into bad king and pawn in games <laughs> yeah it's uh it's not i good. like playing king and pawn in games i find my rook and pawn in games are a little worse my king and pawn in games uh, well maybe not i don't know i've lost i've lost my fair share of king and pawn in games like when i was up two pawns and then i just let the pawn penetrate my position and then like oh he's taking what he's taking them you know 
one by one. Mm-hmm. I've had that happen, but but I like Pawn and King uh, King Pawn end games. I just like them, like playing them. They they're very tricky. Um, okay, well let's talk about this one. I feel like so this one wrong actually very quickly. B three F six, and then B four. Uh, B four is a huge mistake here because it gives the outside passer. Um, so we'll. We'll have to talk about this one. Actually, b3 might already not be the most accurate move because, okay, basically what's happening here is like, you know, it's a waiting game, right? We're trying to put black into Zugzwang so our king can uh, advance. Um, yeah. And actually, black isn't really... I didn't want to drop my king back. Push this one. Yeah, because, because if they do push a4, then you'll go c4, takes, takes, and the pawn is going to be lost because it's too far advanced. Um, whereas in the current position, if you played c4, takes, takes, king, c6, pawn on a5 would be would be safe and black would be fine. Um, so we're basically yeah. trying to run black out of moves here. I don't know what the best move is for white. It would be either f4, maybe g3, something like this. But if black is accurate, maybe they, they defend if they can figure out the tempos. Although our idea would be to go like f4, g3, and then at the last possible moment, if you need a tempo, then maybe you have b3 in reserve. Because this is very valuable. You can play b3 whenever you want, whereas black can't really play a4, because then they get hit with uh, with c4. Um, so it'd be, it would make sense to save this move for for when, like, um, you know, all the pawns get locked up. And, for example... Yeah. I think I went into this position, and then I just made the wrong move. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's winning. That's winning. So yeah, this something like this is what we're kind of dreaming of. Um, and then, uh, I mean, not even sure. It still needs to be calculated. Like King C six looks like White can come in and um, clean up. Yeah, is uh, is gonna be faster here. Take, take. Um, what are we? It's here. Actually, I don't know. We. So why would you go there instead? Oh, instead of King G five. I think King G five is fine too. Um. Okay, so mess. We're I both promoting. Push yeah, and then push the C pawn with check, trade the queens, and then the uh, the C pawn becomes a D pawn, and we uh, we uh, we've got that long diagonal. That would that would work. The problem is, um, black promotes first first yeah whose turn is it now and then this is uh, black to move or white to move. move yeah okay yeah but uh oh actually there's a really good point in the chat sorry let's go back because this is very very deep um we could have played b3 as white and made our lives a lot easier <laughs> So this is the power of prophylaxis. You and stop your and, and, and yeah, you win without calculating. No moves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Whatever he moves, yeah, I take, I take the pawn. Very interesting. Uh, okay, let's go back. So b3 is okay. Um, b4 is kind of a lemon because it's like you're you're giving your opponent an outside passer with w these are often just deadly in king and pawn end games and now our king has to go super passive and and track down this pawn um yeah i think that's what i counted on and i i figured oh i then i'd go around the back and go for the pawn oh i, I see what... i see so you were that's why i did it because I, I counted the moves i said the, the king was on c4 so he goes one two three four it takes me four moves to go d3 b2 uh c2 b2 a3 mm -hmm. while uh his the, the, it would take four moves for him to promote so i said okay that pawn is not promoting if i just swing my king around i see so yeah you you definitely stop the pawn but then well we end up in this situation which actually i, I see your point this one could end up bad for black it actually ends up being a game of tempos again. Whoever runs out of moves is going to lose the game. Uh, it's yes, which is uh, <laughs> kind of a bummer. And I didn't work out. I didn't, in a ten-minute game, you, you don't start counting the tempos. Yeah, just or at least I should have. But who knows? H four. And that was uh, a big mistake. Yeah, that was a big mistake. I think I meant to push that. Um, yeah, and there you go. 
Oh, to H3? I, 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 yeah, yeah, I meant to move it to H3. I, I didn't really want to move it to H4. I think um, I'm not going to call it a mouse slip because that sounds like an excuse, but I think in my mind, I had in mind H3. But the thing is, H3 doesn't really, uh, it doesn't save actually because black has this really nice, it's actually a very uh, famous idea of breaking through. Oh, that's through. a classic, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Idea. Chat, yep. chat, uh, chat knows yep. this one. Good, good, good. Uh, everyone should know this trick because um, it's yep. it's very important. Actually, many end games um, rely on <laughs> on this exact idea. Um, so yeah, shame on me for not for not knowing it, for um, not thinking about it. It's but it, I mean, it's actually the funny thing is that like the important part because both sides queen, but it's at the end. That black's queen delivers this mate. So it's because the king is on yeah. a three that like it kind of works out. That's so a lot it. of these things are so um so dependent on the position. That's why a lot of players they don't like king and pawn in games because they're very hard to um anticipate, you know. They come down to one tempo, it's like impossible to calculate. And yeah, unless you're a couple black couple black, I will uh Well yeah, I mean that yeah, kind of he just he had yeah that's what I was I, I, I yeah yeah mm -hmm. I, I've read his book like on 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 the um like I think it's chess fundamentals and he gives these chess, king and pawn end games he's like black has mate in seventeen moves I'm like without a computer how did he know it was seventeen and not sixteen <laughs> he's, no, he's sure it's seventeen and there's no mate in sixteen like, <laughs> how does a guy do that yeah that's uh that's funny um no I mean he. Well, he has this reputation of someone who like didn't calculate that much, but no, his like analytical skills were like uh, were really strong. Um, that's true. White maybe has some tempos there at the end, but as soon as you play King B two, um, the king gets into C four, and then Black's D pawn there ends up being um, really active in that position. So, if White let's say played here and something like this, then um, the issue is. White's king gets checked on a4. So a lot of these things, you know, they just come down to these like concrete details that are just really hard to anticipate. You know, there's no way intuitively to know like, oh, this position just has to be winning or has to be losing. At the end of the day, we're kind of just guessing. Um, but uh, but overall, your decision to go for this end game was definitely correct because you you have the better side of things. It's just just we ended up misplaying it. Um, and you know, in a turn of the game, at this point of the game, there might have been three minutes left. And I'm saying with three minutes, I'm not, I'm not starting to calculate this out. Yeah. But let me just play it through. I don't care if I win or lose. And then afterwards, I'll have a good time analyzing this with a computer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then um, I'll play it for next time. Right. Yeah. Like, it. We rarely have enough time in the end game, and so. Yeah, it's all about just kind of like the decisions that you make, whether they're like practical. Or, or not, because we're never going to play those positions 100% uh, perfectly. Um, okay, next game here. Oh, this might be another blunder. This knight takes e5. I mean, we were playing black. There you go. Yeah, this is yeah, this is the other. Uh, this is another blunder. Yeah, we yeah. Right, right. So I play d3. We don't quite register like oh, e5 pawn is now hanging for real yeah it's usually because like yeah and the roy lopez you're sort of like don't worry about that pawn because you can always you know quickly attack it you can along the e-file like in, typically in the roy like you you want to exchange those e-pawns yeah but i didn't realize that because he had done d3 and backed up his e-pawn there's there's no there's nothing along the e-file but the reason why i didn't see it is just like oh, okay it's a roy i'm just going to develop my pieces you know i know where the pieces are supposed to go in the roy lopez don't worry about the e-pawn just don't even think about it yeah, yeah. Typical blitz blunder. I would say this one is not, not unique to you. Um, yeah. Actually, I, I'm sure there's lots of games where like white, uh, black hangs the pawn and then white doesn't even take it because they don't expect that it's hanging. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yeah. That happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, time. Okay. Well, we, we did try to fight back a little bit here. Yeah, I had a pretty good game in the end, anyways. Yeah. I mean, bringing the knight there with no other pieces, uh, it's a, you know, there's no hope, but I'm just, and I'm on the queen side with that knight, it's just weird. Mm -hmm. 
I think also I gave you this game just to show you how I blunder. And a lot of these blunders are happening in the opening. Like sometimes I'll come out of the opening great. Sometimes I'll come out of the opening of Pawn Down or Peace Down for no reason other than I just blundered. Mm. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, it's not necessarily you're playing um, too quickly. Uh, just situations where you're not really expecting uh, a lot of tactics. Um, yes, that's it. When I'm not looking for a tactic, my puzzles, I, I'm looking for a tactic, I'll sit there, I'll calculate it, I'll spend two or three minutes to calculate. In a game, so often I check it with a computer and there was like a, a simple you know, fork or something like that. I just didn't see it during the game because I just wasn't looking for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this might be something you'll have to work on like uh, consciously. Actually, something I've been working on lately too is just trying to be like more tactically alert during games. For me, the process is actually just very like very conscious, just reminding myself whenever I play, like you have to calculate, you have to calculate like every second and you have to be calculating on your opponent's turn uh, as well, especially your opponent's move. Uh, you need to be thinking about like what you expect them to do and analyzing what your move is going to be, what your response is. Um, and, and it's really hard because it's easy to kind of drift uh, for me during the game when it's not my turn. But for example, okay, you, you played knight c3 here, the opponent is thinking, and uh, if you catch yourself you know, drifting, you try to pull yourself back and, and start calculating again. Okay, what if they play queen e7? What if they castle here? What if they play d5? What am I gonna do against these moves? And the more like analysis you can do, generally the better off you are, right? Because you might pick up certain tactical details. Oh, this move doesn't work because I have this trick. Oh, but in this position, maybe this trick doesn't work for, you know, and then the more you kind of analyze ahead of time, uh, the better off you are. Now this is specifically for rapid chess because like Blitz and Rapid, again, your time is very limited and every second is useful in terms of being able to figure something out about the position. In classical chess, when you have like uh, two hours on your clock, you don't really have energy to be just hardcore calculating the whole game, like two hours for yourself, two hours for the opponent. And so the advice there is often to try to be concrete when it's your turn, you know, thinking move by move, I'm gonna play here, I'm expecting this or maybe this move. Um, but then when it's your opponent's turn, it can be useful to think about more strategic aspects of the position. Now, this might be something you can use for your games um, as well. When it's your opponent's turn, you could be thinking about things like, um, you know, which pieces do I want to trade off here? Or what are the weak squares in the position? Um, in addition to already thinking about like, what are some possible tactics, but also thinking about, again, which pieces do I want to trade off? What's my next move here? Like, how am I going to improve my position? Are all my pieces, you know, doing the best that they can? Here, of course, we're still in the opening. So I would be thinking about like, how am I going to develop everything? And what would be kind of like a good scheme? Um, can I play D4 somewhere? And uh, along, along these lines. Um, so, yeah, that might be something like maybe I'd recommend writing on a post a note, uh, <laughs> like when you play to like remind yourself, like, look for your opponent's threats, always be calculating like uh, anything like this that can that can help you. Oh, we took maybe not a great decision. I think I didn't want to lose that e-pawn. I, th I thought if I retreat the night but it's it's the wrong decision because i could always then bring the rook out with over here i'm like mm, well where do i put that knight i have to bring him back which just we, like my attack like it's not attacking if i'm moving my knight back and then he's going to take my pawn mm -hmm. uh, and then what do i do i think the instinct here is take... often um you find a way to give the pawn back but uh but keep the initiative um so that yeah might have been might have been the thing to do. Actually, he can't, I don't know if he can really take the pawn if I take the knight, but he can't take it with a queen. He's got to take it with a knight. Then I can pin the knight with, uh, you know, with uh, rook to e1. Exactly. And then put pressure on that, on that knight. Exactly. So something so like that, yeah, would already be like enough justification. Because um, knight of seven, you're, you're giving up the two minors. It's like these are very active pieces. Um, but here, yeah, like if nothing else, rook e1. And then, um, okay, black can get out, like knight takes c3, hitting our queen, but here we can yeah, we can consider taking on, these. let's say we take back on c3. Um, and and I guess you, you wouldn't really have to go further than this. This is where you would just kind of pause and evaluate. Okay, the double pawns aren't great, but 
you have so many more pieces out than your opponent yeah. like looks pretty good looks pretty um yeah. ambitious and i actually like yeah. that our pawn on d4 that's being hit by this bishop is defended by a pawn because that kind of takes some pressure off uh the oh yeah and yeah, no, i like I'll, I'll very often double my pawns in the uh in these these center like these these like sort of center games or these like classical e4 e5 games like the you know the spanish and the italian and, and the scotch and all those mm -hmm. i'll very often let my pawn doubled mm -hmm. yeah for the for the sake of the initiative absolutely so th this position makes sense to you you would you would be happy with white here yeah i'd love I, this I, I love this position yeah cool yeah. now i don't know why i didn't calculate it out i should have said okay yeah knight goes back um he takes i put the rook there i should have seen that but i'm like okay you know what um, maybe this is the, this is another case of where my mind sort of said, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. It's sort of one, two, three. Uh, let's not. Let's just complicate things mm -hmm. for no reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other yeah. than I was just being late. Right. Right. So not not the most uh, let's say practical decision. Um, so okay, then we start building up again. Knight gets trapped. Nice. Yeah, Technic was good again. I'm just toying with him here. <laughs> no no you you did fine i mean when you have low time it's like whatever gets you to the goal you know um so that was no that was good yeah, exactly um all right let's jump to another one number seven all right here we're playing yeah, i think since last night i can send you a couple more i don't know if i've sent you enough games um i'm not sure maybe i, I feel like i have at least some idea, but I don't know. We'll see. Um... Okay, so here we're facing the Karo, and we went for uh, advanced variation. Nice. Yeah, I always go for advanced variation. Cool. I always put the bishop there. That's that's my standard repertoire against the Karo. But I hate playing it. I should try, probably try finding myself something else. But I hate having to defend that d4 pawn. Because I'm always looking for aggressive attacking ideas and having to, like, for white to be defending a pawn. And I hate playing the Kara. Mm, well, let's. I'll help you. <laughs> there, there, there are options. Um, as I know what you mean. Yeah, because we're basically when we play it like this, we. Um... I should be attacking here, right? And instead, I'm I'm thinking about that d4 pawn. I don't want to be thinking about that d4 pawn. Well, we basically got a structure that's like a advanced French, right? And except that Black got their light scored bishop out from c8 and onto g6, neutralizing our, our best piece. Um, so basically, Black has solved all their problems here because they, they got their bishop out and they have... Yeah, so I, I'm with you. This position is already like White's not happy. Um, so there are different ways of, of playing this line. You don't have to go bishop d3. Um h4 i would say is maybe the most aggressive way people play this uh okay this the move comes with an immediate trap if black goes e6 yeah. you um you get the bishop yeah but those h4 on move three or move four to me is like so i like that that like i see magnus carlson playing that those types of move all the time like i, I want to develop my pieces like i i'm not a pawn player i'm a piece player and then I, you saw the other games, right? I move my pawn at the very end. When I've run out of piece moves, I say, okay, now it's time to, to start breaking open the position with a pawn. I mean, h4 or an a4 or an h5 to me is totally unnatural. I gotcha. In that case, then, I would suggest maybe a different variation here. Um, so one that's actually pretty simple to I play. actually like the exchange. Yeah. You can play this one. I like the exchange. It's very much like a Sicilian, and I thought I loved I love those Sicilian English attacks, right? I mean, I don't know. I don't know how similar it is, but it. I, I don't know. I think it's um, a very playable position, and it's pretty simple to 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 learn. Um, the idea is 
to kind of use this e5 square long term. So one day, like you're going to castle kingside, you're going to try to bring your knight to e5, and then kind of double up on the e5, like queen e2, rook e1, bring the other knight to f3. So it's kind of all about this e5 square. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that fits my style. I think it's pretty simple. Yeah, one, one. I mean, there's different ways to play it. Like, you know, after knight f6 here, you can go knight f3. Um, a lot of players will play bishop f4 in this position so that they're not getting pinned. And then on bishop g4, you can bring your queen out. But we're not going to get into the, the theory here. It's just uh, just a suggestion. Because um, yeah. here you kind of I mean, get a fixed structure. And, yeah, it's not like the other positions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The problem I have with that is like often after the knight goes to e5 and then there's a trade, I have to take with my pawn. I never like putting my e pawn on the fifth rank. I, I feel that that's too advanced for me for a pawn. I like to hang my pawns back. Hmm. You mean when you go, uh, you're playing knight e5? Yeah, if I play knight e5 and, I tra and then he's got the knight on c6 trading on e5, often I have to make the final trade with a pawn. Or not the final trade. I, 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 often the pawn ends up on e5. I don't like that, that, now that now he's got like that queen side majority and then I've got that advanced pawn there, which is an easy target. Like I don't, I don't like those pawns on e5. Okay, I see. I mean, this one can be good. In many cases, actually, we're, we're quite happy to get the pawn to e5 because the pawn on e5, of course, takes away the f6 square. And what this does is it means that black's knight can't be on f6, which in many positions is actually like its most solid square. Um, so this is what allows white for in like a lot of cases to execute like a Greek gift sacrifice is because this pawn was on e5 and there's no knight on f6. Um, or to advance like yeah. f4, f5. I would encourage you to kind of rethink this one because this is something where you kind of want to judge it on like a case by case basis. There are many positions where like black just goes knight d7 and then the pawn ends up weak and it, it, everything you said is right. You know, the pawn is just like overextended and, and then black ends up winning it. But there are lots of positions where the pawn on e5 is quite strong and it gives you a powerful kingside attack. And you don't want to limit yourself by kind of like missing out on those cases. So um, long story short, sometimes this like uh, structure change is good and sometimes it's not that great, but it's kind of up to you as a chess player to figure out in, in which positions is it uh, worth it for you and, and which it, it isn't. Because in many cases, it actually will be quite good. Like in this in this concrete position, if knight d7, apparently we're taking this pawn on d5. So that's obviously good for white and if black can't play knight d7 um then the knight doesn't really have such a stable square like on knight e4 we can always kind of target the knight with knight d2 and just uh immediately trade it off um and then this kind of position actually i i think is is pretty sound for white because you go bishop d3 here you castle and then your f pawn and your e pawn will make a pretty nice um chain together in fact if you get this pawn to f5 you have e5 and f5 supported by your bishop and the rook these two pawns are are quite strong um so this can be a structure that's okay. you know totally uh, uh totally satisfactory yeah. for you yeah and i like that you know it gives him an open c file so he's attacking on the on the queen side but then i can focus on my attack on the king side it's, it's that's why i compared it to a sicilian Mm -hmm. And as I said, like I like those positions where I get to just be focusing on my attack, and then you know, not so not not so much on his. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. So I'm Especially glad as... we I'm glad we talked about this one because this is like an opening where uh, it sounds like you're struggling. You're, like you're not getting the positions that you want. Yeah, especially out of Karos. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's important to think about yeah different openings and whether yeah whether you're happy with the positions. Honestly, that's maybe the most important thing about opening selection is just getting positions that you enjoy, you kind of understand the ideas and you know exactly how you're going to um, to to play it. Uh, and, and since you know you're like an attacking player and you want these like attacking positions, it, it gives you an idea of what you're, what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, it would be good to kind of review. Can I send you another camera? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, because I now that we've spoken about this game, let me show you a care I just played today. Um, I'll, I'll let me attach it here. I was just downloading the moves here, so it's uh, here it is. Mm -hmm. There you go. I sent it to you. Okay. 
Um, I think I mislabeled it. Oh yeah, yeah, I gotta be PGN. Oh, oh yeah, I, I said P. Okay, I, I mislabeled that. I sent you that correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Sure. Okay. Uh, just a sec while I load this one in. Okay, great. Yeah, kind of the same thing again, where black gets this French, where they traded off their light squared bishop, and they just have like a perfect French, like super, super comfortable position. And you see, okay, in this position right here, that's where I've got that uncomfortable e uh, e5 pawn. So that's right. why in, in the Karos, I always end up having that trade on d4 and then being uncomfortable with, with that pawn. Right, so yeah, I'm, I'm this with is, you. This is not a great version, right? Because we're missing our light squared bishop. Black has traded off their bad bishop. And we're left with this bishop on g3. That's um, not that great. However, if we could just like helicopter your pawn to f4, I would say your position is actually totally fine because you have this like massive pawn advance. And then the plan would be to bring your rook to e1 and then push like f4, f5. Which even here, I think yeah, would be the problem dangerous. But he's mounting pressure on my on that e pawn already. He's got three attackers on it, so I can't even move that knight on f three. So how am I ever going to get that f four move in? That's why the position's no good. Yeah, because it's like you don't get you don't get that key setup that we're looking for. So um, yeah, these things it's always like case by case um, basis. That's kind of how I would how I would put it. Yeah, and that's why that's why I say I hate playing the the care and I play the advanced version. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm stupid for playing advanced version, but this is this is the type of thing that happens to me always in the advanced version. I make the advanced version, and then there ends up being a series of trades on d4, and then suddenly that e5 pawn is is too far advanced. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's an opening where strategically it's like it's very double edged actually, because when you when you advance the pawn, you take space, and then whenever you take space, that kind of opens you up to pressure later on, um, and, and yeah, it happens to to the d4 square. Um, so yeah, it is an opening that might not be like the the most um, comfortable for for a lot of players, and that's why a lot of players do like the yeah. kind of simpler exchange or uh, like knight, uh, two knights uh, things like that. Um, but, uh, apparently, well, so he yeah, takes the pawn, and this kind of opens everything that's up. Yeah, now yeah. you have all this pressure on the e file. Um, knight c4. Yeah. Here, I think we might have missed a, a nice tactic I, here. I, I missed. Yeah. Exactly. I couldn't find it. I hear I stopped for a minute or two. Couldn't find anything. Um, and I saw he was attacking my b2, so I'm saying, okay, well, I can't find a, 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 a tactic here. Let's just defend what he's attacking. Oh, this is, so you remember, this was a moment you remember pausing in. Yeah, I was like, I, I know there's something here. I know there's something here. Uh, there's a series of exchanges here that wins me a pawn. There's there's a pawn. There's a pinned pawn on. You know, there's that battery on the e file. Something something is going on over here. I just didn't know what. Mm -hmm. Couldn't find it. So that, maybe that's like bishop. I, I was thinking about bishop takes bishop. Right. Knight e five. Uh, he can't take it because it's pinned. But then I always saw that that bishop is protected by the knight. So what do I do then if he takes it with a knight? Mm, I looked, I looked, I looked, didn't find anything. So I'm like, okay, I've got to make a move. It's been three minutes of thinking. Right. Queen to e2. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Um, yeah, it happened. So there's like two different things. It's like number one, um, yeah, like when you, you miss a, a tactic, it's either you didn't know it was the right moment to look or you looked, but you didn't find the idea. So in this case, it's like the second. Um, is you spend time calculating, but just couldn't spot uh, knight takes e6. So this was like a problem in um, uh, candidate moves. Because I think once you see this move, knight takes e6 is possible. I guess what we need to see specifically is that we're hitting the queen on, on c7 with check. 
And so that just looks super promising. Like, oh, if we can take this with check, that's kind of a nice with check yeah. detail, right? Because our queen yeah. is hanging two, of course. So that's why we have to be extremely uh, precise. Oh, yeah, um, so I look at that. Yeah, yeah, I take those two pawns. I come in with my queen with check. I have now two attackers on the d6 bishop, but he's defending it with the knight. So what then? All right, so knight takes pawn, pawn takes knight, mm -hmm. queen takes pawn, it moves, then what? Bishop takes bishop. Right, and knight he, takes yeah, bishop. Exactly. How, I, I have, like, why yes. exactly is that so? Um... I got to the end of the forcing line. When I calculate, I just look for, I, I, I build my calculation around the trunk. I mean, that's the technique I like to use. Just say, just get what one forcing line to the very end, and then look at where it branches out. I think that's the correct way of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but I calculated this forcing the trunk, and I saw that the end just peters out. I said, okay, where along that trunk can I add in some other extra attacking moves? And I didn't find anything. Mm -hmm. There's so, no other pieces. I'm using all my pieces. So let's well, let's just think about this position. So this is so this is the one, yeah, where it's like how to um, continue. Let's say we just take this pawn on d5. See, to me, this is a too slow of a move because now he can take my 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 my, my bishop. Mm -hmm. He can retreat his knight attacking my queen there's some well he can't because i take the bishop but there's i'm just saying that that's the point where i'm like where you get to the end of the trunk and now it just there's too many possibilities for where it branches out so here i say stop the calculation right. and let's just discard this candidate move i see okay actually hg is no fg is of course much better because uh opens up the rook um so this to me is but i'm still down a piece i'm still down a piece in that position right you are down a piece so queen takes but um, the thing is, is that Black's king is just so weak. Um, so this is kind of like, so you're, you're right. At the, when there's no more forcing moves, you shouldn't really try to calculate uh, too deeply. Because then, yeah, if your opponent has like a million options, you're not going to see like what to do against all, all five of their moves. So then you have to evaluate the position. So this is a question of evaluation. Yeah. Um, because... We have some material for the piece. We have like a two pawns or something. Um, but this one is really just about understanding that when the rook, the rooks are in the corner like this and the king is disconnecting the rooks, it's super, super dangerous for black. Even though it doesn't look like white's pieces are giving mate, your rook is coming in like rook ad1 and your rooks are ready to lift. And, and this actually, this happens very, very quickly. So a lot of these positions, we end up kind of underestimating the attack. Um, it's one of the things that the engine, I feel like, has taught us. Number one, the engine has taught us that a lot of posi positions can be defended that look really, really bad, but the engine finds resources and, and holds them. The other thing it's taught us, actually, or at least me, is that a lot of these positions that don't look that look like your attack has kind of stopped, as long as the king is weak enough, like your pieces still come in. And so the engine just calculates far enough. It just sees like, okay, a couple of quiet moves, but the rooks come in and just it's going to be mate. There's no way to get the rook on h8 defending in time. I mean, especially with FG, it, it becomes very clear that we have like Rook F1 coming and this is just like uh, a monstrous attack. But even if you don't see FG, yeah, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't see FG uh, <laughs> originally. I was just thinking like HG. Yeah. This position is also better for white, maybe not as much, but um, the yeah. fact that Black's Rooks are disconnected is actually like, it, it makes things very, very difficult for Black to play. The Knight doesn't really have a good square. It's just gonna be floating. Um, and if knight b6, like the knight is so far away, it like doesn't even, you can play a quiet move here, like queen h5, and I would still take white because we're, we're so active. Um, and, and the rook is, is just coming in. Um, but not an easy this one is to evaluate, I mean, that's like, for sure. What's that? Sorry. Yeah, like I followed some of the games from Tata this year and like, I, 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 I saw this, like these players were all doing that. They were playing these like lines that the end of the line sort of the place where you would cut the calculation off and you're down in material but you're ahead in position and i'm always uncomfortable playing that because i'm a tactical player I, I like to think in terms of material if i see a, a line and i get to the end of the of the of the forcing line and i'm behind the material but ahead in, in positional i won't play it i won't play it hmm. but maybe i should you know yeah, because there are many positions where, right, you could be down material, but everything else is going for you, and, and that makes up for it. So this is um, this is like the theory of, let's say, 
um, material time and, and quality of position, kind of like the three, the three basic aspects of chess. You have your material, of course, which is kind of self-explanatory. Then you have time, meaning like whose pieces are actually in the game. And then you have what we would refer to as quality of position, which is things like the pawn structure and the king safety and, and things like that, that aren't always so easy to, to evaluate. Um, and uh, yeah, you can absolutely trade material for, for both of these things, for time, you know, getting some tempos while your opponent is busy uh, grabbing pawns, as well as quality of position, which is going on in this case, white is giving up a piece, but ending up with a position where our king is much safer and our rooks can get into the game. So we have all of these kind of advantages that uh, will basically provide compensation and, and uh, beyond that as well. Um, definitely this is something I would love for you to see more examples of. Um, and, and if you look at a lot of the games of like attacking players, you'll see that it's not, um, it's actually pretty rare that you just get a, a sacrifice and it's like, take, take, check, and then mate. You know, if you get that, that means your opponent like blundered. <laughs> so to create an attack, a lot of times you have to like really sacrifice something. And that means playing down material, but with the expectation that your attack is gonna pay off. Your pieces are gonna get there in time before your opponent is able to consolidate and, and defend everything. Um, yeah. And that's what the puzzles do to you. Like the puzzles, you yeah. say you sacrifice your queen, or you sacrifice the exchange, but then two moves down the line, you win a piece and two pawns, right? You're like, okay, that's a winning material. And these puzzles are all, it's very hard to find puzzles. There are some advanced puzzle books that have those types of position that we, we were just talking about where you give up material and then the line ends where you're white winning, but down in material. Um, but those are the, those are the things that actually happen in games rather than those, those puzzle books where it's right. tactics. Yeah. The material at the end, right? yeah, like those are rare. They they come up more often as you get more and more advanced. But right, some puzzles will end in a position where we're down in exchange, but the king is about to get mated because our queen, you know, is on d7 or something, and then the rook is coming in, um, or you know, the fg might be the final move, and then the rook the rook is coming in next, and the king gets checkmated even though you're currently down like two pieces or or something. Um, yeah, it happens. It's one of the most difficult things to evaluate is just like material imbalances. Um, but that would be a topic I would strongly encourage you to, to start um, looking up because I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of um, stuff about your play that, that is really uh, like well developed, like just I feel like there's some positions you just play like very naturally and you just know exactly what to do. And um, you're just like converting very easily. Um, but then if you're not able to like find those moments where you need to like sacrifice something or like play dynamically, um, that can really hold you back because some positions they need a very tactical solution. Like this one actually, this was you know a great moment where if you if you take the plunge and you sacrifice, even not knowing if you're doing well here or not, just knowing that you're gonna have good chances, then once you get here you realize, oh my attack is actually really strong. Um, and, and that'll be kind of good for your game. Versus if you kind of back down from the sacrifice then you know usually you end up making some kind of um concession so i would encourage you to actually take some risks especially if you're not sure about the position but you feel like there's some potential there um because you know the one or two games it doesn't matter so try it out and if it works yeah. then it's like either way whether it works or, or doesn't you're going to kind of learn something yeah about how to like evaluate these positions That's and you'll you'll be able to kind of calibrate better exactly um so good advice yeah okay i've kind of already started with the uh <laughs> with the diagnosis but um there's a couple of things i would suggest for you so number one this um book by israel gelfer positional chess handbook i think will give you a lot of very very um useful ideas to uh and, and like uh, motives to, to think about um i would also encourage you to um, maybe look into some books on um, different pawn structures. Uh, someone mentioned the Flores book in the chat. Um, uh, what was it called? Chess Structures, uh, a Grandmaster Guide. That's a really good one that shows a lot of different pawn structures and how to play them. Um, you'll also get some, let's say, pawn structure knowledge in, in the first book that I mentioned. Um, but, but this will give you a, a good sense of like what kinds of plans you could be playing for in different different positions and how to kind of evaluate positions 
with different structures. Yeah, go ahead. I have Soltis's book uh, on pawn structures. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another one, Ivan Sokolov's book um, about the structures, but those are sort of, I, I took a look at that and they're not, they're not um, like standard structures. So I don't know if that's the best book. Um, but yeah. a lot of these books I feel are more opening oriented, sort of understanding the structures of particular openings. Right. That's kind of how they're uh, presented. But the thing is, is that like, you can get the structure from many different openings. So, you know, we'll call something like, for example, the advanced French structure, like in this game, even though it came from a Karo Khan. And this kind of happens frequently in chess, where you start with one opening and then you get a structure that's more familiar or more uh, related to like another opening. Like you can get a King's Indian structure from, from many different openings, like Rui Lopez, Sicilian, um, all kinds of stuff. Um, so it's really about understanding the typical plans and ideas in each structure and then kind of figuring out how they apply in, in the given position. So almost regardless of the openings you play, you're still going to be seeing these different structures from, from time to time. Um, but yeah, the Soltis book, I've heard kind of mixed feelings about it. I think it might be okay. Um, I, I'm a fan of uh, Sokolov. I think like Winning Chess Middle Games is the book. Um, as far as I remember, it does go into more like D4 openings and D4 structure, so it might not be the most useful thing. Um, the Floris book covers a wide mix of like E4 and D4 openings, so you'll get, um, maybe not every chapter will be super relevant, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of really useful stuff in there for you. Um, and uh, and then some of these other books like, uh, you know, Helstein book I mention all the time, uh, the Positional Chess Handbook. Um, these will contain a lot of like the strategic ideas that I think would be helpful for you to start like picking up on um, uh, so that you can kind of start using these ideas during during your games as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, any questions, Joel? Uh, no, I can't think of any questions. I think we've had we discussed a lot while we were looking at the games. Um, any other anything else? Uh, yeah, well, let's see. Um, to to sum up, um, right, we're playing a lot of uh, Blitz and Rapid. Generally, we're playing well, except some games, yeah, we have these like kind of one move blunders, which happens to everyone, but maybe is happening to you a little bit um, more more frequently than like a player around your rating. Um, not sure exactly what's the fix for that. In, in my experience, when when I find that I'm blundering, it's because like I was kind of focusing on the game, but I was also kind of like zoned out or maybe, yeah, like not in that concrete um, mode. So as much as you can, you want to kind of develop this like uh, mode you're in where you're just like in this tactical flow and you're always, always calculating, looking for uh, Canada moves, captures, um, forcing moves, you know, doing your like tactics check basically every single move for both you and your opponent. So if your opponent makes a move, you immediately try to figure out, oh, is that a blunder? Can I take advantage? Is that hanging anything? And before you make your move, it's very important to kind of do that blunder check and making sure that you're not hanging anything or allowing um, any kinds of tactics. Because of course, it's not just sometimes we hang pieces, but also sometimes we hang simple tactics that um, are, are easy enough to find in the right context, but if we're not looking for them, very, very easy to, to blunder. Happens to, to literally everyone. Um, so that's kind of the practical side. And then on like the knowledge side, like building up your chess, I would definitely think, yeah, exploring like pawn structures and um, strategic ideas. Someone mentioned Practical Chess Exercises by Ray Chang. That's another book I think has some really, um, really interesting problems um, and, and positions as well. Um, worth checking out. That is kind of what I would recommend for you. Uh, I know you're going to be doing the Yusupov book too. That That's a good one just for your general chess uh, skill and calculation. Um, and it might have some elements of positional play in there uh, as well. Um, okay, well, I, I guess we'll be wrapping it up here. Uh, thanks, Joel, for uh, joining me. Um, hopefully we will... Uh, touch back in in a couple months, see how you're doing. <laughs> and um, uh, hopefully you're, you know, you're well on, on your way. And I'm on your uh, Discord. So, and you've seen me post there a, a bit. So we're, we're still in touch. That's for sure. Absolutely. Um, all right, guys. Thanks everyone for tuning in. 
um, you can catch uh, the full episode of this and previous episodes on my personal YouTube channel um, if you want to see past episodes of the show. And uh, yeah, we do this every Thursday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we work with a new student, look at some chess, and, uh, and diagnose their games. Um, so all right, guys. I uh, hope you all have a good one. Take care.